Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us live or joining us um, a little bit after when this has um, aired. My name is Diana Tsuchida, and I'm the creator of Tasaku, uh, which is an oral history project um, sharing stories about the World War II Japanese American incarceration. And I'm honored um, to be hosting today's panel, uh, The Loop Group, um, in commemoration of the 80th anniversary of uh, the opening of Topaz. And so um, I also wanna thank uh, my partner in this, Kimiko Mar of the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages for um, helping to spearhead all of this programming um, that you've seen, uh, that you will see today and, um, and might be seen over the next couple of days through our um, other live streams. So I wanted to, um, for share uh, what we're going to be discussing in this um, panel today. And I'm honored um, to share that I have three um, really uh, inspiring and prolific researchers, artists, and uh, professors on um, uh, the history of World War II, uh, the history of incarceration, anthropology, and um, uh, history in general of um, the United States. So. Uh, first is Art Hansen. Um, he is a professor, uh, was professor of history and Asian American studies at Cal State Fullerton um, and retired in uh, 2008 as the director of the Center for Oral and Public History um, and was also uh, author of Barbed Voices, Oral History, Resistance and the World War II Japanese American Social Disasters. So many of you out there um, have probably met, encountered, and read something by Art, uh, and we're so grateful to have him here today. Um, our next panelist is uh, Claudia uh, Katayanagi, uh, who is a wonderful documentary filmmaker, and um, specifically for this panel discussion, um, will be revolving around her film, A Bitter Legacy, which was um, about the citizen isolation centers during World War II, um, but she has, decades of experience in the film world uh, as a producer and I believe um, more specifically as a sound mixer and recordist um, and now as a, um, a director of different um, documentaries and she has an upcoming documentary um, called Community in Crisis, uh, she can, uh, <laughs> Community in Conflict, excuse me, um, which we'll, we'd love to hear more about later. And then lastly, we have uh, Professor Davina Two Bears, um, who is the visiting assistant professor of anthropology and a, po a postdoctoral fellow at Swarthmore College um, in sociology and anthropology. And I'm very honored to have her here today to discuss her research on the old loop boarding school and now how that uh, research is overlapping with the incarceration site where Japanese Americans were held. Um, and her own uh, uh, grandparents uh, were actually, or uh, attended the Old Loop boarding school. And so very honored to have um, her here today as well. So uh, these are panelists and I wanna begin with our, uh, with a very brief overview of why we're talking about Loop uh, today. Um, in a topaz commemoration um, sort of project. So Loop is an isolate, was an ice citizen isolation center. Um, and when the camps originally opened, you know, these were not camps that uh, were planned for, these came later. So Topaz was one of those original 10 camps. And I want to start off with this photo um, where my grandfather is on. Uh, the far right uh, at the end of the table wearing a black um, pinstripe suit. And this photo um, is actually a photo of the loop group that uh, according to my dad's um, recollection, this was the group of men um, who mostly I believe were initially in Topaz and then sent to loop together um, and basically stayed friends um, for many years after the war and would get together at restaurants to just 
you know, be socialize, um, but to talk about those times. And th it was truly a bonding experience for them. Um, so these are, um, I believe, a lot of men that were incarcerated um, at Loop um, at some point or another. And so I love this photo because it's, um, it's, it's really indicative of, of uh, a moment where people <laughs> came together um, and stayed together and connected um, due to a really traumatic experience. But now they ate and celebrated <laughs> together and, um, and stayed in touch. And going back to Topaz, which is where my family originally um, was taken to or incarcerated. So my grandfather, my grandma, and my dad, who's very young at the time. Um, but I want to start off with this clip that uh, is from the Topaz Times, this newspaper clip. And you can see on the left column where it says, Ernst reveals full data on Tsuchida case. So Tom uh, Tsuchida was my grandpa. So he, uh, his claim to fame is that he made it in quite a few of the um, publications <laughs> that came out in Loop. And um, essentially what happened was um, he was accused, um, and I'm, I'm sure he did this, but he was accused of basically, um, I think, starting trouble with somebody that he thought um, was kind of acting as a spy for some of the... Um, different resistors that were in Topaz. So the details of this, um, you know, really aren't worth getting into too much because there's a lot, but I guess it's just the essentials are my grandpa um, was very, getting very politicized, very vocal during his time in Topaz and became one of those people that he became aware of um, kind of the, um, the backdoor sort of discussions and uh, communication between the WRA administrators and some of the other Japanese Americans who were in camp and people who were kind of being um, snitched on essentially um, for their views and their behavior. And so I think my grandpa was um, kind of following one of these guys and wanted to confront him. And the story was, was that I guess he kind of had a, he had a stick. <laughs> he was carrying a stick, and um, and that this um, particular person that he was following um, went to an administrator and said, "That guy's following me," and that set in motion a whole set of uh, a whole slew of events that um, first started with an interrogation um, of my grandfather, um, where he was denied. Uh, an interpreter, so he couldn't really understand um, what was being said, and he was um, really intimidated during that. Um, and over those next few months, it just really was decided that he um, could not stay in Topaz, that he was going to be made an example of. Um, so you could see here that this is this uh, correspondence from Ralph Barnhart, um, project attorney. Um, and the first line um, says this would seem to place Tsuchida clearly within a class of aggravated and incorrigible troublemakers comprehended um, by et cetera, et cetera. And then the next part is Tsuchida may properly and legally either be prosecuted by the criminal processes of the state of Utah or removed um, from uh, the Central U Utah Relocation Center, Topaz. Uh, to Loop Center under the provided processes of the WRA. So that was the language that they used um, in order to remove him. Now, um, I wanted to show uh, where Loop was um, in relation to Topaz. <laughs> so um, it's very far away. And according to uh, a document or an interview, actually, that Art um, Art Hansen uh, did with uh, Paul Robertson, who was the director of Loop, that we'll get into a bit more. Um, my grandpa arrived or was taken from Topaz to Loop in a uh, uh, blacked out car um, in handcuffs um, and was transported all this way um, 
as as a prisoner. Um, and and this was the experience that he had. I don't know um, how that was for him. I never got to talk to him about um, what that was and what he went through. And I really regret that um, he passed when I was, you know, too young to know any of this. Um, but I can imagine it was quite traumatic. Um, and there's been a lot of other um, stories and as in Claudia's film too, about how the men were transported in really inhumane ways. So I wanted to just give some context for the distance of, of where these two locations are. Um, this says now that my grandfather was in loop <laughs> and he was transported there in June um, of 1943. So um, this just went on his record. Um, his record from the National Archives is about 200 pages long because <laughs> they had a lot of doc documentation on him. This is the site of Loop. Um, and um, so I can't say when this was um, actually taken, but this is the site of the boarding school. So you can kind of just get an idea of what that was like. Um, and this last um, correspondence here is from um, Francis Frederick, who was the chief of internal security. And this is his, uh, what they called the institutional history on my grandfather and just sort of a docket on what Frederick noticed about my grandfather, which is um, in his words, he was oversensitive, suspicious and aggressive. <laughs> There is evidence of a persecution complex. He has a chip on the shoulder attitude that was very evident during the first few months um, at Loop. However, this attitude has simmered uh, considerably at this writing, simmered down considerably. Um, and later he says, we recommend that, you know, Tsuchida does not be allowed to join any pro-Japan groups or Kibe groups. Um, and that though he's generally not going to cause any more trouble. Um, so this is just a very brief snippet of, of his experience, but um, this was really um, you know, illuminating in terms of where um, I had so many more questions about um, my grandfather's uh, sort of character during this time and what he must have been thinking, um, being isolated from his family alone. And so um, for today's discussion, you know, we all four um, have, uh, I think, different vantage points of this site, of, of this physical space um, in Arizona, which is on the um, Navajo reservation and, um, you know, uh, has this history of government control um, and property and um, discipline and imprisonment. And uh, all of us, I think, are coming from this with these different perspectives, which um, I, I would like to say as a descendant of, a, um, of someone who was in camp and at the site, the three panelists here, our three guests, you know, are are the answers to some of the questions that we have, that we keep in our minds, that we can't get answers to usually uh, because our grandparents are gone or we don't have the resources um, sometimes to know where to look and where to start. So um, this is why this is very special. I I want to first begin then with the larger question to each of you. Um, and I guess I want to start with um, Claudia first with this question as uh, why the site of Loop um, and the history of Loop is meaningful to you and in particular, um, specifically in your profession as a filmmaker. Why, why is Loop significant? I'll mute myself. Um. Well, as I, you know, in, in looking at the broader history, when I came across these citizen isolation centers, I just said, what? You know, it just piqued my curiosity to the extent that how could you isolate them any more than we already, you know, all these families already were, but they did. And and in the manner in which they brought some of these men to, to Loop um, was 
almost a rendition. I mean, sometimes uh, I interviewed Dan Harada, Tanuka Dan Harada, and they came at night, the towpaths, and they put them in a, you know, in a vehicle, and they darkened all the curtains, you know, and the windows, so he couldn't see where he was going. Um, and, and then, then to be treated in this way, I mean, with the label of the troublemaker. Many of these men were not troublemakers. I mean, they were mislabeled. Dan, Tony, Dan was a painter. He was a very gentle, you know, man. And uh, his his crime was that he was a kibe. You know, he was born in, in in California, but was sent to Japan for his education. And he, you know, as a result, um, with that label of kibe, they just deemed anybody who went to Japan was obviously a danger to to the country. And so he was, you know, taken off and. Um, you know, to me, Loop was a, a symbol of the sense of control that the WRA wanted over these 125,000 people of Japanese ancestry. So that, to me, is the, I think the, the optimal word. You know, that's what they were looking for was control over everybody. Thank you. Um, Davina, what about your perspective of, of your research now is, is crossing over to the isolation center, but loop in general also in, means something uh, very personal to you. Can you talk about why it is significant? Um, it's significant because my, my grandparents went to this boarding school when they were young and they told me stories about their experience. And my grandmother died when I was 12 and my grandfather died in, I think, 2000 two or something and so I just remember these stories and then I started working as a tribal archaeologist and we did some um, projects with local schools at the the site of the old loop boarding school and and also we you know talked to students about the boarding school history and the loop Japanese uh, internment history there and I didn't know really about the Japanese internment history until I did that project. And I was really shocked that there was, you know, an internment camp on the Navajo reservation. And then also when I went to grad school, I, I didn't know what my project was going to be for my dissertation. But um, I, I started researching potential projects and I thought, well, I should, you know, write down this history of the old loop boarding school because I soon realized that the only history that's been investigated about this place is was just a little bit at that time um, about the uh, loop isolation center that was done by the Park Service. And that was before Claudia did her film. So I was like, I can't believe that this huge archaeological site that everybody knows about because they either went to school there or their family went to school there or they worked there. Um, it's an important place to the local Navajos um, because it was it was the center of government um, in the early 20th century and education and there was a hospital there. So I was like, why isn't any, you know, the boarding school history, where where is it? <laughs> You know, it th there was nothing. There was nothing written about it. Maybe the name of it was mentioned um, here and there, but there was actual actually no documentation of the Navajo history of the Loop Boarding School. And there was also there is also very little. Now there's more written about the Loop Isolation history, but um, so that's why I really wanted to document this history for the benefit of not only the Navajo people, but also, um, you know, broader America. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And Art, uh, as your perspective and as a longtime researcher and historian of the World War II experience, Japanese American experience, why is Loop significant um, in your eyes? Well, uh, when I, first got into Japanese American history, it was 50 years ago. And uh, before that time, I was an expert on American and British intellectual history. 
But after I finished my dissertation on that topic, I returned to something that had bothered me when I was a senior at UC Santa Barbara. I wrote an article uh, for a class, a sociology class, about the Japanese American experience, which I, at that time I didn't know anything about, even though I had friends who were Japanese Americans, they never talked about it. And uh, the paper that I wrote, I, I thought was superficial. Uh, and uh, it sort of stuck in my craw, and I thought that someday I wanted to correct that situation. And so I decided to switch my emphasis from doing British and American intellectual history to devoting my career to researching the Japanese American wartime experience. And so the very first article that I wrote was with one of my graduate students, David Hacker, and it was on the Manzanar riot which was a major sort of catastrophe in the camps because it resulted in two inmates being murdered by machine, by, by uh, 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 military police fire and, and nine other people being injured. And then the net result of it was that, uh, 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 that the people that were considered to be the, the instigators behind all the turmoil at Manzanar most of whom were Kibe, were, were picked up and sent to a jail. And then they were a local jail in the, in the Owens Valley. And then they were shifted from there to the Moab Isolation Center in Utah. And so uh, uh, because the people that, that went to Moab included the principal figure in the Manzanar riot, Harry Ueno, who I had interviewed extensively and co-edited a book about called The Manzanar Martyr. Uh, I was very interested in his progress through Moab and through Loop, and by implication, the progress of all the other people. And so each of those camps turned out to fascinate me, and I continued to do work on both of them. I wrote a, a piece for the uh, Densho Encyclopedia, which is about both Moab and Loop. It's well documented. And then I, I did an interview with Paul Robertson, which... Uh, uh, has already been alluded to, who was the, the, uh, one of the two people that served as the project director for, for Loop. And uh, so in any event, it, that kind of, you know, and then I ended up writing an article which hasn't been published yet, but it, it was on this person who was the associate director of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, internal security at the Gila camp. And then he came uh, with 13 of the key bay that got thrown out of the Gila camp and put into Moab. He came to Moab with him. His name was Francis Frederick. And then when everybody transferred over to Loop, he became into Loop. Now, he was a person that you've already been introduced to by Diane because he wrote that docket up on her grandfather. But he not only wrote a docket on his grand on her grandfather, but on most of the people that were at Loop. And basically what he wrote was that these people were picked up without any other reason than the fact that they were alleged to be troublemakers. And you saw that word in, in, the, in the documentation on, on Diana's uh, grandfather, troublemakers. They weren't giving any trials. They didn't have any chance to defend themselves, et cetera. They were summarily picked up and dumped into what turned out to be, especially at Loop, even more than Mo, a high security prison. You know, uh, man proof fences, uh, uh, a 150 people uh, 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 armed a group with, with, with machine guns uh, uh, and, and watchtowers, et cetera, surrounding the camp, et cetera. So it was a high security prison. So, anyway, that's how I got involved in it. And I, I'll go into other things later on in response to other questions Diana might have. Thank you, Art. Well, we're very glad that you switched your focus and research <laughs> and switched it to what um, your career ended up being. You've already alluded to this, um, which I think is a perfect transition into a question I wanted to um, put to Claudia, which is in your film, and I recommend uh, if you can, everyone, watching, uh, try to watch her film, A Bitter Legacy, uh, which is on Amazon and YouTube, and you could find it uh, many ways. But in the film, the 
there was a description of loop as something of a precursor to what was called a shadow site and something of a precursor to Guantanamo. Can you talk about why it was characterized that way? What made it uh, basically described that way in your film? Oh, Claudia, you're muted. It, it was uh, the historian Roger Daniels uh, who said this statement in, in the interview I did with him. And I think in comparison to all the other sites, he he saw that they were, well, like, like his art was describing, even in Moab, the guards outnumber the prisoners four to one. You know, they were just treated, you know, very, very much more harshly. I mean, in Moab, they had to have somebody go with them to the bathroom. I mean, really? I mean, come on. Um, Again, it's a sense of control and, you know, oh, they have a label, a troublemaker. And, you know, everybody was, um, um, but but I think the 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 shadow side is like, again, no no trials, there no charges ever. And that's, you know, it's just a, it's, it's just a continuation of the racism, you know, that there was a lot of mistaken identities that, at, at these places. And there was no, um, they, they had no recourse to, you know, like, hey, why, what am I accused of, you know? Um, and uh, some, you know, that, um, but your your grandfather was was uh, hired to, he worked at the uh, administration. He worked for the project director as a gardener, apparently. And so you, that garden is, is is forever, you know, recorded in, in Dan Tanayuki's painting of the administration building. You know, all the green, that's the only place in the area that has that much greenery around it. Because if you've been to the site, it's rather, you know, it's it's that's just right. dry and, and, and so on. But um, I, I, um, I, I think, you know, the way that the, some of the people, the uh, five men were brought from Moab to Loop was in that box. I recreated the box and I heard the description of how they were transported from Moab to Loop in a five by six, three foot high box with one hole for air and put on the back of a truck. And you saw the distance of the map, how far it was from Moab to, to, to Loop is 450 something miles on a very bumpy roads. They didn't have highways in those days, interstates. And, and I did that recreation of that box just so people can understand how cruel, you know, what an you know inhumane way to transport anybody, much less five men in the back of this, you know, in this little box. Um, and I think that's kind of how I, I see it. That was torture. To me, that was torture. And I think that's why I feel like, yes, the treatment too was very much like, you know, like Guantanamo kind of a precursor. You treat people just so in inhumanely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, um, I, you know, I wanted to actually say too that in your film, you do show that painting uh, that shows the administrator's home. And at the time that I saw your film, I didn't know that my grandpa was the gardener. I, that only came out later when I read Art's interview with Robertson, and that was years later. So that was a revelation. I, I did not know that. And so it uh, was very touching for me to see something that kind of was, uh, as you said, archived and permanent um, for us to kind of have a reference. Davina, I wanted to ask you about what your family, and I believe your mother and grandmother remember uh, about this moment of this history when the Japanese Americans were living there. I think you were mentioning there were some memories that your, your grandmother had of their pers perspective of the people that were brought there. Yeah, um, we, we just have a you know couple of memories in our family. My grandmother told my mother that um, she felt sorry for the Japanese men who were in prison there, that a lot of Navajos felt sorry for them. Um, they didn't understand why they were prisoners because they seemed like they were harmless, you know, really nice people. And they felt sorry for them. And also, um, um, and then my mother just told me a story the other day 
um, that that um, Navajo people used to bring uh, food for for you know the men, the Japanese men. They would take food to them and give give them food. Um, so that was something that I just learned as well. That you know that's something that the the Navajo people did. Um, again, just because they they felt sorry for them. Right. What and what was the reputation of the boarding school itself to the Navajo community? What was the reputation of that site? Well, I think. I think at that time, um, you know, this was before World or yeah, before World War II, before 1942, and from 1909 to 1942 is when the boarding school was in operation. Um, with with that building that you showed, that was actually the first building that was built in 1909, and that that was the building that first housed everything like the dormitories, the classroom, the kitchen, but then loop, you know, continued to grow over the years, but it was, it was an important place because, you know, it provided um, an education for local families. And, and also because, you know, there was always a clinic associated with it, a hospital. So, you know, that was, something that was needed. And right when the school was built, there was also a Presbyterian church that went up and um, the, the loop trading post was also um, built at the same time. And, and that trading post closed in 1980. So it had a very long existence there. So people travel, traveled there, you know, the, from around the area because that was the only closest place, you know, to go to the hospital, go to school, you know, um, go to the trading post to get food and supplies or take take your art arts and crafts there to sell. So it was an important place for for the um, the Navajo people in that area. Um, you know, they were forced to take their children to boarding school. Um, my my grandfather was threatened or my I guess he would be my great grandfather was threatened with jail if he didn't um, take his daughter to the boarding school, my grandmother, because she used to hide every time. And they would send out, you know, the, um, police, the Navajo police to find children to take to school. Um, I mean, some parents would voluntarily take their children there, but, you know, these boarding schools were meant to assimilate um, Native Americans, including Navajos, into American society. And they were taught vocational, a vocational uh, education and a gendered education where they weren't being taught to be lawyers, scientists, and engineers. They were being taught to work as laborers. Um, you know, the boys learn blacksmithing and carpentry and they, uh, the girls learn, you know, housekeeping, um, so sew, sewing. And so, um, but nonetheless, you know, this was a place of governmental, it was also a place of government for the Navajo people. It was a, it, it was, um, a place where people, you know, came to um, get, you know, government um, help or, you know, learn about things that, you know, the government is, you know, federal Indian policy that, that needs to be um communicated to to the Navajo people. So it was it was a very um important place because you know that that was the only other boarding school on the entire western half of the Navajo reservation was in Tuba City, which was about 75 miles north of Loop. So um you know it was it it, it you know, Navajo people were forced to take their children to boarding school, but at least um, I think this the thing that the people um, thought was better was the fact that they didn't have to take their kids to a boarding school like in Phoenix or, you know, Albuquerque. This was a local federal Indian boarding school and they would be able to visit their children um, it was with it was a within distance that they could at least you know be you know have their children still in the community even if 
they were allowed to go home for like nine months out of the year because they were at boarding school. Right. And thank you for reminding all of us of that fact that they, you know, in a other situation, they would be very, very far from their children. They would be, you couldn't have access to them. So I could understand that if you had, it was an, it was not a great option, but it was the option that was best uh, for them. So thank you for sharing that. And I, I just want to insert too that it's interesting uh, because the only small detail or, uh, you know, s- sort of, it, I guess it's not a myth because everything my dad has told me has actually ended up being pretty true, <laughs> even though the, I, we can't trace it necessarily. But he said that my grandfather, apparently, uh, while at Loop, they were on a truck somewhere on just a flatbed, you know, I, I'm not a pickup truck, rather, um, driving and the road was really rough. And for some reason, my grandpa fell off of the back of this truck. <laughs> um, and and for some other strange reason, they didn't realize that he had fallen off the truck and didn't come back for him. But he, the story goes that some young Navajo men picked him up in their truck because he was walking back to Loop and they gave him a ride, but that they wouldn't, they they stopped at a particular distance before they got to the fence because they didn't want to get too close to this government run uh, prison mm-hmm. and they wouldn't, they wouldn't bring him right to the front. <laughs> so I, that's like the only tidbit um, of story that I have of my grandpa's uh, personal experience there. Um, but I kind of love that it's overlapping with the Navajo community and uh, people that are there. Um, it's just really, it's just fascinating. And um, Art, I wanted to transition a bit to your expertise and your um, your one-on-one in uh conversations with people who were administrators and in specifically Paul Robertson, who was the director at Loop. You did a really extensive interview with him um, in his later years and you asked him about his ability to get along with the Japanese people. Um, Could you talk about why he felt that he had good rapport with the Japanese community and why he felt like he understood them. Can you talk about a bit of? Yes. uh, You know, uh, there was a book written in 1944 called The Governing of Men by Alexander Layton, who was an anthropologist. And uh, he was in charge of the Sociological Bureau at at Post Inn. And uh, he made a distinction about administrators in the, the, the war relocation authority camps. And there were those administrators who regarded the people that they were administering as people first and Japanese second. There were the other administrators that regarded them as Japanese first and people second. And the two people that were connected with the administration of Loop, one was Raymond Best. He would fit the description of regarding them first as Japanese and secondly as people. And Paul Robertson, the opposite. They were first for him people. He just felt that he was a Christian, a very strong Christian, came from Christian background, ministers in the background. He was a bright person. He had been an architect. He was a lawyer and everything. He worked a lot with Japanese Americans when he worked for the agricultural department in California with the farmers and stuff like this. And he had no fear whatsoever. He felt that what you had to do was to respect people as human beings first. And all of these so-called incorrigibles, these troublemakers who had given Best a lot of difficulty and everything because of the maltreatment they got from him, they re- they responded exactly the opposite to, to Robertson. Robertson even had the, the, the so-called incorrigibles serve as babysitters for his kids and everything. And he was very friendly with the Indian people and his wife worked with the Indian people. And when the Robertsons left, all of these Indian women came together and had this wonderful party for Mrs. Robertson. So the whole family had this 
Robertson was a humanitarian and everything. I thought he was a little naive at certain times and everything. I mean, he lived in the South for a while and didn't even recognize the fact that they had Jim Crow laws when I was talking to him. But, but basically, in spite of his innocence, et cetera, he was a very, you know, kind, gentle person. And uh, he went on to Tule Lake after that. And, and uh, his experience at Tule Lake was the same sort of thing because he worked under Raymond Best there. So there was a big difference in Tule Lake. So anyway, uh, does that answer your question? It, it does. That was perfect. And it goes into my next one uh, for you, Art, is what is your personal per, uh, point of view or opinion on the WRA administrators? And I know that is an enormous question because they were very diverse um, in terms of personalities and perspectives and the like the two that you just described. But your personal sort of point of view, what is your take on the administrators themselves? Well, you know, I, I think what I what I mentioned just before, what Alexander Layton said about what they were, how they regarded people, either as people first or as Japanese first. I, mean, I think that's a, a kind of a working generalization. And I've done a lot of administrators with, uh, you know, uh, of the camps, uh, the man's in our you know, camp, I, Robert Brown, who was associate director, and Ned Campbell was associate. And Robert Brown and Ned Campbell were very much opposite uh, in terms of how they cared for people. So there was, as you say, a lot of variation and everything. And, uh, and, and you, could, you could write an account showing those people who were very much humanitarian oriented in the camps and, and looked out for the interests of, of the people in the camps and tried to do the best for them, et cetera. Uh, but of course you could find these other people. Ultimately, the organization is an oppressive organization because what they're trying to do is to maintain the fiction that somehow or other these were relocation camps mm -hmm. and everything when in fact, what they were, were prison camps. And, and, and that, the, that these people, did not deserve, basically the 120,000 Japanese Americans who went to the camp after Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, all of those people were basically seen as troublemakers or as possible subversives. And so it plays itself out through all of these different camps, not only the 10 WRA camps with the two isolation uh, centers and then the uh, segregation center at Tule Lake. So you got to remember that they're predisposed to see them as somehow or other evil, you know, and, and in need of, of correction, very much as the, as the Navajos who were sent to the, to the boarding schools. In other words, their Native American, you know, experience had to be sacrificed on the altar of becoming full-born born, so-called Americans, which means you had to take the Indian out of them. The one thing about... About, uh, I'm glad that uh, Davina is on this panel because I always was curious about, I knew that the most of the boarding schools were away from the populations of the Native Americans. But in this case, the Navajos were right there and the boarding school was there and so it was a little less oppressive. But in the other places, they, they were, I just got done reading a, a, a 600 page biography of the famous uh, uh, Indian athlete, Jim Thorpe. And Jim Thorpe, went, you know, went to Carlisle, and Carlisle was was the premier sort of, you know, uh, uh, school for uh, uh, for a boarding school for Indians, et cetera. And you know, this was their whole rule that they wanted to make them over into something that they weren't, and everything take away their their own culture and and, and make them into a, sort of you know a, a special type of American. You know, uh, they were whitewashed in, in a sense at those schools. Of their culture and of their uh, of their beliefs and their practices, etc. Thank you. And I also want to just uh, insert quickly that if there are questions or comments coming in from anyone watching, please uh, feel free to type them in, and we'll we'll get to them in a few minutes. Uh, I have just a couple of more questions that are are going to transition more to the legacy and impact of a site like Loop uh, that was operating under this presumed necessity to control uh, so-called troublemakers that really 
in today's sense, we're just protesting on, on their civil rights. And um, Claudia, in your film, you, you have so many great interviewees and storytellers and people that are really significant to the community uh, that are most Nisei or Kibe and you know, that we ha are losing. So many of those people you interviewed have passed. Um, what, what are your thoughts on what that means for our, for the community of to lose, be losing the Nisei voices that is our, one of our last ties to knowing what the experience was of the incarceration? Well, I saw it as a, I panic. I, I wanted to, if I could, I, I just had an army of people interviewing as many people who are still around with us to tell their stories. And that applies to every community, Native American, Black, everybody who has a connection to, you know, this kind of history. I think it's important to, to record them as quickly as possible and to talk to. I tell people, Go to your grandma, and she's still around. Have her bring your phone and just interview her. Have her talk about her experiences, because you know we will lose we will lose those stories if we don't capture them in some way. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I think um, when people watch films or you know read that they I see now that people are learning how important it is for them to stand up and speak out and to. Uh, speak out. I mean, the like other Japanese American groups are speaking up on behalf of Black Lives Matter, or on behalf of Native Americans, um, and that you know we. I I'm in, I'm optimistic about how the younger generation is, and has learned from you know the the last generations and and are speaking out and helping, um, you know, people in detention today. You know, I mean, I did this whole three films about Japanese Americans who were in prison during World War II, talking to people who just came out of a recent detention center for Im immigrants. And, you know, how parallel, you know, these are all parallel stories and, and how important it is to, to support each other and, and, and um, to speak out. So, um, I, I mean, Loop was, you know, the citizen isolation. I mean, you isolate people, really, you know, for, for you know, it's basically a racist, you know, uh, trope. And so my, one of my next films is about uh, the DOJ, the Department of Justice camps and, you know, the, what happened to the Issei, you know. And one of the one of the threads is that it was Duncan Williams is in a book called American Sutra. And basically the premise is it's un-American to be Buddhist. Mm hmm Right, and that's part of the whitewashing of the community. You got to be Christian. This is a Christian nation. You know, damn it, you know, and and um, I, I think it's so important that you know each of our cultures, you know, just cling to that part of our our ethnicity, our the, the aspects of our culture that make us, you know, who we are. Uh, and I want to you know support any 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 movement, any um, uh, enrichment of cultures to, to keep to hang on to those those threads of our culture uh, it's so important we are a nation of you know immigrants to begin with and and we should retain you know those those threads of our identity so um, that's why I'm encouraged by the younger generation to to really you know go out and fight for for what's right and civil rights and so um, I think it's important that part is important yeah, take a take a cue from our uh, from our feisty grand grandparents who <laughs> um, who really taught uh, left quite a legacy for us to fill if we have that in our history um, because the there is a uh, preconceived notion or was I don't think it's as common anymore because we have entered a new phase of openness about this history but. Um, that that the Japanese Americans went quietly into the camps. That was not true, uh, as we know. So we have um, a question. Oh, from um, Hanako, uh, who is one of our, who is a fantastic uh, community leader. She does so many things. Um, so for Davina, um, in your research of Loop, have you come across any stories about interactions between tribal members and the Japanese Americans during the war. Any stories that you can share? There 
you know, there unfortunately hasn't been a lot of research in this area. I mean, Claudia probably has done like the most about interaction between Navajo and Japanese. From what I know, the Navajo people were told to not talk to the Japanese people, the Japanese prisoners at Loop. They were, even if they worked there, they were told to not speak to them or interact with them. And, um, um, some of the stories, well, one of the stories is that um, the um, a Japanese men learned how to say hello in Navajo. And so when the Navajo people would walk by or, you know, because like I said, the trading post was right next to the boarding school. So there was a lot of traffic there um, that would, you know, go right by the boarding school to get to the trading post. Then the, the Japanese men would say, yat eh to the Navajo people and that means hello in Navajo and so that was one of the interactions that they that they had there um, with with the Navajo people so but you know they're really I I I think that if I what Claudia says about also you know interviewing people that were actually alive during that period it's such a you know, they're passing away, you know, they're in their 90s now. So um, it's, it's, if there were more than more stories about the Japanese internment at Loop, I think, you know, it, it would be now is like the last chance to really get those stories written down or recorded. But really, I th that's, that's about all that I've ever heard about you know, interaction between Navajo and the Japanese prisoners that were there. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. And Avina, uh, would you like to just quickly also share the research um, that you're working on now that uh, with another professor, researcher that, and, and when can, what can, uh, you know, we expect to sort of see, and we, I'm sure it's an ongoing endeavor, but <laughs> we'd love to hear about it. Yeah, I have a couple of projects going right now. Um, I'm writing a book chapter with Hannah Mariama from University of Connecticut on um, the history of um, Loop Isolation Center. Um, you know, she's also descendant of um, grandparents who were sent to you know, internment camps, Japanese internment camps. So, um, and she's written her dissertation on internment camps on indigenous lands. And so um, we got, we're, we're working on that project right now. We're um, just, you know, really talking about, I, I kind of like comparing, I guess, the stories or the treatment of both um, Navajo children at the, at the Loop Boarding School and also the Japanese, um, Americans who were in prison there as well. And, um, you know, just looking at the intersections, I guess, of um, how they were treated. And um, um, we're, we're mostly drawing from archival records and, and how, you know, it was decided that Loop would be even a site of Japanese American, you know, uh, you know, an internment camp on the Navajo reservation. How did that happen? And then also um, the, the, the weird, um, I don't know, like just the fact that, you know, at that time that the, the, the United States was recruiting Navajo people because they spoke the Navajo language and they wanted them to be code talkers against the Japanese empire during World War II when for this whole time they have been suppressing the language in this boarding school. But then when they needed to use the Navajo people's language, then, you know, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just, yeah. there's, there's all the irony of that. Yeah. <laughs> irony. And, and then, you know, the fact that there were actually, you know, Japanese Americans imprisoned on the Navajo reservation at an Indian boarding school and just like the like the same treatments that both you know 
both of these groups were experiencing with this within the space of you know uh, um, within the space. Right. Um, so it's haunting. Um, it's uh, so anyway. I'm working on that project, and then I'm working on another project with some call our archaeologists, uh, friends of mine, colleagues, and we're um, um, doing. Hopefully, what we would like to do a community-based project where we would hopefully get to do some, um, I mean, prob probably not excavation, but more like mapping of the site and maybe doing some surface analysis and maybe doing um, a, a um, story map or some kind of um, um, way where we could uh, Document, document the history, make it available on on um, using technology like people's phones. If they could walk around out there, maybe hear about the history of the the loop boarding school and the Japanese isolation center. Because right now, there's really nothing out there. But we, you know, we need to. We we have gotten initial support from the loop chapter and Bird Springs chapter, but we also have to go through the Navajo Nation government to get. Um, approval by the Institutional Review Board and the Heritage and Historic Preservation Department mm -hmm. before. So we're just like right at the beginning stages, but I, I would really like to do something because, mm -hmm. you know, I think that the Navajo perspective um, of events is rarely documented or researched by Navajo people. Mm -hmm. It's starting to happen more and more as more Navajos um, begin to write and, you know, really do research of our history and our, or any issues. Um, but, you know, in the past, it's always been non-Navajo, non non-Native Americans doing this. So, um, you know, this project um, that I'm doing with my friends Two, two of them are Japanese, um, June Sinceri mm -hmm. at Berkeley and Koji at Stanford. And Tim Tim Wilcox is a Navajo um, archaeologist who, who, who I've worked with before um, for, uh, uh, for the Navajo Nation Archaeology Department. And his wife's family is from that, right on Old Loop. They live right on Old Loop. Oh, wow. So I really wanted to make sure to um, include him because, I mean, he's a talented, you know, person, arche archaeologist. Um, he's a PhD candidate at Stanford. Um, and, you know, it, but it, it's just exciting. We're just at the beginning stages. So that's right. um, a little There's bit about what, what I'm working on. There's a lot to, to come, which sounds like an incredible project that we, the communities really need. And we do have a couple of questions that came in. Uh, Art, did you, I, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss you. You didn't have a, a comment, did you, before I go into the audience question? Yeah, it's just the irony that uh, the Vina was talking about when she said that, you know, that, you know, in a sense, they, they demonize the language of the Navajos and everything, and then they use them as code talkers for the purposes of, of the war. And it's the same thing that with Japanese Americans, especially the Kibay. The Kibay were the ones that had the Japanese language. And of course, they became the backbone of the, 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 the MIS, which was the military intelligence group and everything. And, and, and the work that they did probably shortened the war by a couple of years and everything. So it, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're demonized, but then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're when, when you're really needed, then they draw upon you and everything else, and then they create you as heroic in in that sense. But but the rest of the group is not really, you know, given that same sort of status. So, and I just wanted to say one other thing too, uh, and and that is about the what what's being done to to guarantee that we have these voices well the very first book i worked on in in, in 1974 was called voices long silent and it was the oral history of the japanese american country. these were people that had not talked about it before and they i we found out that they were they very much wanted to talk about it and this was way before dencho started and dencho of course has been incredible i mean what dencho has added in the way of information 
in terms of collecting all of these voices and everything. And it's there's small projects all over the country that are doing it. But you know, at the point in 1974, people were keeping a lid on these things. And instead of talking about it, they were suppressing you know, uh, any conversation about it. So oral history is a very important part of this whole leavening the loaf of, of what this experience happened to be. So exactly. thank you, Art. There is, a, Hanako had is another great question for Claudia. So uh, as you developed your documentary, what was the most interesting experience that you encountered learning about the isolation centers? This is great because this is, was going to be a question for me. Uh, shocking, positive, or negative? Oh, you're muted, Claudia. For Davina, you could go to, uh, on the Navajo Reservation, the woman in the film whose father was one of the men who built the actual uh, boarding school. I mean, she has her tool, her father's tools in her at her shed. She's the one who provided the picture of the farmer's market. That they used to have farmer's market within the, you know, the courtyard at the school. And, and so there are, if you, I mean, I can sort of point you, I mean, I should give you the footage I have. Uh, of you know Mr. Peshtakai talking about his experience at the boarding school, and so there's so many. It was hard to make this film because it, you know each avenue I explored. You could do a whole film on each of those little chapters I made within a bit of legacy, and and um, uh, I will contribute that too. If there's a Navajo you know library, I will contribute some of the footage because it's they're fascinating stories and they they can be developed by students, you know, Navajo mem members to really explore. Um, I mean, I'm sure like, um, they, you know, when I was, as I was doing the interview, they, when they went to a shed and pulled out these photos and that's where I discovered the farmer's market that we held, was held at the Loop boarding school. You know, it's just, you know, beautiful touching little, you know, images that, <clears throat> that, that enrich everybody's history. And so, uh, I just want to encourage people to go look through your grandparents' boxes in the attic and 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 you know see what you you can discover. Um, I mean, in the same sense, there's a hundred. Now they just you know through Duncan Williams' work, we've discovered there were 125,000 people of Japanese ancestry who were incarcerated during the war. And I really want to make sure that we make that distinction between incarceration, because you incarcerate people who are citizens. You don't intern citizens, American citizens. You can, you can only intern people who are not citizens. And because the Issei were not allowed to become citizens, therefore they were technically interned. You know, the first person to be arrested after the bombing of Pearl Harbor was a Buddhist priest in Hawaii, even before martial law was declared. And Duncan Williams has records of that. And so it's, um, you know, as, as I said, just go, go record everybody's histories who, who are around, just talk to them. And, um, uh, I I know that the, the, the I forget his name now who lives right outside in the Mad Minute. He said they would go out and collect things. They found you know as they were digging things up that uh, you know so but but there are stories that a lot of the records were buried in that in in that and there were um, underground you know storage facilities. So I would like to go get a big plow and go see what what could be found you know when you dig up. Uh, on that side, I might walk the site, and I just I've noticed that a lot of stones have been taken or removed um, because they're beautiful. I mean, the the boarding school has these wonderful stone markings on, on the top of the building. If you look carefully at the other side, the front part of the building, because what that image you showed at the beginning of this session was on the rear side of the school, and if you, you look in the you see the picture of the archway where Harry Ueno and the five uh, four other men were. That was sort of the, the entrance into the to the boarding school, and um, you know the I, I believe I I went to the um, in Flagstaff. There's a, a library there. They have a lot of um, photographs of Navajo people when they they uh, they would come to the trading posts uh, and and trade their sheepskins and things for for you know flour or butter and you know the basic supplies they would need. So I have stories of you know people doing that, and um, uh, it's it's such a such a rich heritage. I think you know uh, I I was just happy to 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 meet meet the, the Navajo members I did, and and thank you. You know I want to thank them all for 
for for being willing being willing to sit down and talk with with me about this this history. Thank you. And uh, I want to, uh, you know, be mindful of uh, everyone's weekend. So I'm, I think we'll wrap up soon, but I will answer this uh, last question, which okay, has come from me. Um, I think I know who this is. <laughs> it's my aunties. Um, has your father expressed his and his mother's feelings and thoughts when your grandfather was taken away to loop? Um, hi, Delilah and Laura. Uh, you know, this is... This is probably the only, there's only one story my dad has of, of that moment. And he just remembers coming home from school in Topaz and, uh, you know, coming around the corner of a barrack and then seeing a car in front of his barrack and my grandpa being handcuffed and put in the car. And my, uh, he remembers my grandmother crying outside the doorway. And then the other really, you know, again, this is one of those haunting things that uh, has, when you hear it, you you just understand how complex this moment was. And then the fact that my dad remembered it so vividly, but he remembers that he looked at, he, my grandpa made eye contact with him before getting in the car, but um, he didn't say anything. He just put his head down and got in the car. And you know, it, it, that has so many complex layers, I think. Uh, and, you know, my grandpa, um, certainly he wasn't, he was no angel. And so, you know, he got in trouble because he was not a, he wasn't a, um, a quiet uh, man who, <laughs> you know, he was, he could be really tough. And, and in the, I think even in that interaction, that kind of shows a bit of, um, the sternness, you know, or maybe just the the not breaking of emotion in, in any way. And um, so for my my dad, uh, I, that was really hard. That was hard because then they were taken to Tule Lake alone. And my grandmother was also Kibe, did not speak English well. So there was no, and there was no family at Tule Lake. So that was the start of a really dif difficult moment. Um, that set off a whole another uh, journey for my grandpa, uh, almost deciding to go back to Japan. <laughs> so that's how angry he was. And luckily, um, you know, he did. They they decided not to. So I want to. I you know I I have more questions, but I feel like we've had a really fantastic discussion today, and um, so I think we'll. We will wrap it up um, here, and I want to thank. Uh, although I see art has. <laughs> well, I, I just want to say that the Moab and Loop sort of uh, connection is important. Uh, in that, uh, the reason that they chose the site at Moab was because a civilian conservation camp had closed there, and so they had the facility. And the reason they chose Loop was precisely because the boarding school had closed. And so they had that opportunity to have more land there. And they were, they were anticipating having more people. Then the other thing in the connection is the connection between uh, Native Americans and Japanese American on terms of shared sites of history and memory. It's, it's important because it was true in Poston, it was true in Tule Lake, you know, uh, it's it, 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 it's true in Loop and everything. And and what they've done in Moab is they've taken the shared memory there. And Claudia and I are working on an advisory group that's dealing with the the uh, the, the Moab site and how it needs to be more firmly acknowledged. And I think, Davina, you should take a, a page or two from what they're doing in Moab, and being able to uh, you know get the resources and everything and the permissions and everything to make sure that this is a place that is recognized, that it's, it's, it's fully identified and there are, there are pilgrimages there and the like and everything else. And I think this is, this is, this is a, a very important step to make. And, and you're, I'm so happy you were on this, on this group because you're working on this. And, and I think if you, if you connect with Claudia, Claudia can give you the information of all the people that are working on the, on the uh, Moab site, and so that it'll save you a lot of time, you know.
Thank you. And and quickly, Arnaud, you reminded me that I wanted to also ask both you and Claudia uh, to wrap up. So you're you are working on an article, correct? That's forthcoming in a publication uh, that or is going to be published. Is that correct? Or is there anything you'd like to sort of share that we can look forward to in terms of your own work? You're talking to who? To you, Ari. <laughs> oh, me. oh, I, I've got lots, lots of publications on their work. One of them I'm yeah. doing is a, I'm editing a, the uh, the Man's in Art Diary of 1942 of Robert Brown, and uh, he was the associate director there. And 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 I'm working on another book called Under Guard Within the Grand Canyon State: The World War II Incarceration of Japanese Americans in Arizona War Relocation Authority Camps, and that includes Loop and everything. So uh, those are a couple of things that, that that I'm working on right now. So yeah. Okay, you are busy. Um, thank you. And Claudia, can you just share what your upcoming film is covering? And very excited to see this. Well, I have two films I'm working on right now. One is I'm finishing up a film about the in Santa Fe. There was an internment camp in Santa Fe. And uh, so a group of people, they, the town built another township on top of the former internment camp. There are 4,555 men who were sent to Santa Fe some of the Buddhist priests we talked about earlier. And so uh, the, some Japanese Americans wanted to build a, a monument to say there was one here. And the townspeople, a lot of the townspeople were veterans. And they said, no, 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 we didn't want one. So it, was, it took two years and a major conflict um, to have actually ultimately have a marker put there to say there wasn't, just as acknowledging the history, that there was an internment camp in Santa Fe. Yeah. So that film is uh, going to be shown, premiered at a... Um, the Smithsonian exhibit on the, in the conservation history is coming to to Santa Fe to the National the, His, the, the New Mexico History Museum. So I'm going to show my film then. Oh, hopefully, nice. I'm working on it frantically to finish it. And then I got a Jack grant to finish my um, film about the uh, camps for the Ise men and um, about the DOJ camps and the military and, and, and DOJ prisons there. So. Over a hundred sites that are for just those, you know, those for the ESA alone. So it's a big history there too. So that's what I'm working on. Absolutely. Well, I, it's uh, the future is very rich with <laughs> a lot of possibilities that the uh, edu the literature and the the facts are evolving, which is incredible. And as Claudia just mentioned in the panel, 125,000. Uh, now is is the correct number, so not 120. And so, this wealth of information that each of you bring to this history to reclaim uh, this experience and to um, really challenge uh, some of the mainstream uh, perceptions of what took place is so critical. And I just want to thank all of you for all of your dedication and work, and you're very inspiring to. Uh, our generation um, that, you know, we only can hope to rise to that level of, um, <laughs> of expertise. So thank you all. And thank you to everyone who um, is watching now and watches later. And um, please feel free to share the link to this YouTube uh, panel. So thank you so much, everybody, uh, for your time today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.